I, I want to primarily, I think, tell you about the fish that I did my research on, because I found the three, four years in which I was doing that research at Birmingham were absolutely fascinated. I was fascinated by this particular fish. And I hope I can convey something of that excitement and interest and enthusiasm tonight. So that will just be fun and interesting, I hope. Um, so it's a collection of sort of of my own stories, I think, more than anything. So there's no particular theme. The talk's not really going anywhere in particular. I've got far more material, I know, than I've... What time should I stop? That'd be a good thing to know at the moment. Yeah. Well, you've got about 45 minutes. Or 45 minutes, OK. So stop about... What's that, about quarter to nine? Yeah. Right, OK. Uh, right, so what I was going to say is I've got far more material than I could possibly cover in, in that time. So I'm just going to sort of ramble on, as it were, I uh, hope interestingly, and uh, when we get to that sort of time, we'll, we'll stop. So as I say, it's, there's no particular theme, it's not particularly going anywhere. I, if there is anything behind it all, perhaps you could say it's response to a common criticism often made, and, and that is that if you reject a sort of a naturalistic approach to science, if you're a theist or a Christian in your approach to science, then somehow that's going to be a science stopper and you're not really a scientist. Well, I, I've always had that approach. Uh, as I said, despite the university knowing that, they still allow me to do research and having uh, put me really through the mill in terms of evaluating that research, decide that I'd done more than enough to get a doctorate. So, if anything, this talk is partly an answer to that question, say, yes, you can be a theist, a Christian, and that doesn't stop you doing uh, good science. Okay. In fact, I put it a lot stronger than that, but we'll leave it at for the moment. Okay. <clears throat> So first of all, just some, some more background. Um, I first really encountered the issue of origins, creation, evolution, call it what you like, in the middle of the 1960s. Um, at that time, for those of you who can remember back that far, there wasn't really very much literature. I mean, if you go out today into Christian bookshops or even secular bookshops, you'll find a wide variety of books on the origins issue. Uh, in secular bookshops, you'll find plenty of the intelligent design movement literature, you go to Christian bookshops, you'll find, again, a huge variety of literature, lots on a theistic evolution approach, lots on a more creation approach, and everything in between. There's an abundance of literature. Back in the 60s, there wasn't. There was, in fact, very little indeed. And so if you were a, a religious believer, a Christian, and wanted to find out what Christians, uh, scholarly Christians, thought about the topic, there really wasn't terribly much to read. Um, and I found most of what I did read fairly unsatisfactory for all sorts of reasons. Uh, particularly, probably, that uh, I'd really started to get into the, the literature and the history and philosophy of science, which really was uh, entering its modern period at that point in the sort of late 50s, early 60s. That, that was when the, the, the work in history and philosophy of science really took off in the Western world. Uh, with people like Karl Popper, then Thomas Kuhn, Paul Feyerabend, and, and many others coming along. And I really got interested in that and reading it. And that, that was the main thing I found, that most of the literature I was reading in Origins was simply ignorant of or ignoring that literature and uh, was, was really putting forward indefensible positions, particularly when they looked at the history of, of scientific theories and the evaluation of them. So anyway, to cut that story short... In 1965, I went up to Birmingham University, determined to find out all I could about this whole origins issue, uh, to read biology, and with the hope that I'd eventually be able to go on and do some kind of research in this area uh, in biology. Right. <clears throat> but before we go any further, we need to be clear about definitions. Because uh, words like evolution or creation or origins you know, are capable of just so many definitions. And part of what goes wrong, I find time and time again when I, I give talks, is that I and the audience are so often working with different understandings and different definitions. So just to be clear, what I'm referring to is, is evolution. 
And uh, two meanings, I'd say, are crucial to the debate, that when commonly in the, in the secular world, and this is true from Darwin onwards, uh, evolution means two prime things. It means universal common descent, so it's a mever to man, particles to people, uh, kind of evolution that we're talking about. And then it, a naturalistic framework, uh, the assumption that nature, physical nature is all there is, is again very much there in the picture. And when people talk about evolution, when Richard Dawkins, for example, talks about evolution, those two features are implicit in what he's talking about. And anyone who rejects those is automatically beyond the pale. Uh, so for, for many of the secularists, uh, a good Christian theistic evolutionist is just as much beyond the pale as, a, say, a six-day creationist. For those who are really committed to naturalism, it really doesn't matter. They don't make the kind of distinctions that perhaps a Christian might want to make. Uh, just say that there is another meaning commonly used for evolution, which is I describe as a distractor. And that's the idea. Evolution just simply means variation. And so commonly I find when I give talks that people in question time will come up with all sorts of evidence of variation, animals and plants, and say, how can you possibly deny this? Aren't you an ignoramus? Or even worse, worse than that. But just to say that is a distractor. Nobody on any side has ever doubted that there is variation. In fact, it's just as much the, a part of creationist frameworks as it is of evolutionist frameworks, and always has been. And if you want evidence of that, you've only got to read the Darwin's own introduction to the origin of the species, where he freely admits that and quotes, in a practice, all the scientists of his age, even though they, many of them strongly disagreed with his theory, nevertheless, they were all equally committed to a belief in uh, variation. The point about Darwinism and evolution is that it doesn't simply say that there is variation, but there is no taxonomic limit to variation. Variation can go as far as you want it to go. That is the fundamental belief that we're talking about. Not just variation itself, but there is no limit to it. That's what the, the secular framework Darwinism assumes. And uh, just to go back to about naturalism, one give endless quotes on this from everybody up to Dawkins and on. But I choose this particular one because it was in a letter to the Kansas Academy of Sciences in 2005. And it's distinguished because it was signed by no less than 38 Nobel laureates. Evolution, they wrote, is understood to be the result of an unguided, unplanned process of random variation and natural selection. That's where I say I wish there was much more understanding of history and philosophy of science, because that is a philosophical statement. It's not a scientific one. It's not one for which science could ever you know, give any decisive evidence. But anyway, that's a statement. That's the kind of statement you commonly find. And so it's worth emphasising that, that Darwinism, uh, and Darwinism is what is normally meant when, meant when people use the word evolution, for both its original author, for Darwin himself, I mean, Darwin is a, was an absolutely committed naturalist, uh, in the sense of belief in naturalism. Uh, as you can see, if you read his letters and all his correspondence and notebooks. So both for Darwin himself and for all the leading modern proponents Darwin is, is the naturalistic theory of evolution. So universal common descent and naturalism are what uh, I'm referring to when I use the term evolution. Um, incident, do you recognize all the figures there? Who's top right? Yeah, John Maynard Smith, bottom left. Yeah, Daniel Dennett, middle bottom. Yeah, Steve Do Jones, a geneticist from London University. And bottom right, anyone not know? <laughs> Richard Dawkins, okay. One of the first things I did when I was doing my research, I'd say, was to, to, to really go into the history and philosophy of science, and, and in particular, the, the history and philosophy of evolutionary science. And immediately discovered as you went back into that history that...